You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And today I have a really special guest. I, I try to listen to everyone when, when they're like, oh, we need to do more bank fishing, more wade fishing. And personally, I don't like just to do uh, sessions. And, and I know with the 4th of July, I, I did a, a uh, and I made an exception to that rule where I just talk for an hour without a guest. I like to get somebody else's opinion on. I love wade fishing. And it was really nice to finally find somebody who also has a passion for fishing the bank, wade fishing, and especially catching smallmouth out of creeks and rivers. Cause that to me is just the most comfort food type of thing to do in the summertime. Thank you so much, sir, for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for having me. On. I appreciate it. So yeah, I mean, what what got you into this? Have you lived in this area your whole life? Well, I am from Maryland, born and raised. Not necessarily the western part of the state. Uh, I grew up in Howard County. Uh, I had a uh, I had a great aunt that had a place on the Magothy River. Oh wow! And so late mid late sixties. That's about the when I started fishing, and and visiting that. Uh, her place there and and fishing and crabbing and I, I just got hooked remember uh first time going out dad bought these uh it was probably from sears or montgomery wards you know three fishing rods and uh i had a bait caster which uh, didn't work at all i don't think i ever casted that thing right but it was enough mm -hmm. it was enough to get me started bait casters are a real pain in the butt when when you first start but then plus so this is like one dollar a one dollar bait caster so it wasn't it wasn't a real bait caster those it have just... come a long way though like i remember <laughs> back when at least i was a kid if you wanted a bait caster you had to pay so much to get a decent one and nowadays anything that's around 100 bucks is like premium stuff i mean people kids get spoiled rotten nowadays with with how good the equipment is yes <laughs> now now with what really got you into the wade fishing specifically versus kayaking, canoeing, things like that? So uh, around 72, we moved to Frederick County. And where we lived uh, was mostly agricultural land, but uh, there was a, a creek, Bennett's Creek, that was close by. And uh, they, they let you go onto the land and fish. And that's where I started wading. Hmm. So that was about, you know, mid-70s. And uh, I started wading there and then... Uh, uh, in the 80s, uh, Monocacy River, yes. uh, I waded that a lot. Uh, Patapsco, when, after I got married, I uh, was living in Howard County again, and uh, I spent many, many hours on the Patapsco uh, down around Woodstock and, and Daniels in that area, waiting. Oh, those creeks are, that's such a beautiful strip of 81 down into the Shenandoah Valley. And then uh, uh, wrong Woodstock, Woodstock, Maryland. Oh, Woodstock, Maryland. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So, so it's a whole lot different. Yeah, it's, it's a whole lot different. <laughs> uh, and then uh, somewhere about the mid '80s started uh, on on uh, Potomac. Oh wow! Waiting that, and that was uh, that was you know that introduced a lot more fish and in uh, a whole lot of area. How much has it changed those areas that you fished back then versus now? So Bennett's Creek is no longer like it was. There's just too much build up around it. Uh, the area that I fished as a kid, I actually rode by there a, a few months ago. And uh, yeah, that's not somewhere that I would fish again. That's so it's depressing. Just, yeah, that, that's different. But Taps goes in a park. So that's pretty much the same. Okay. Uh, Monocacy, I think the Monocacy is getting better. It's, you're not the first one to say that, especially, I mean, I, I do have Jeff Green on from Sh uh, Shallow Water Fishing Adventures, who's an Upper Potomac guy, but I've also had some friends say, like, the Monocacy is starting to turn some out. So back then, if you caught a 12-inch smallmouth, I mean, you were catching something. Wow. And now I've, I talk with guys that are catching 20s and plus. That's so cool. So uh, that's, that's, that's pretty good. For a lot of these places... And I think this is an issue with most bank fishermen or, or anyone that wants to wait is public access or gaining access. 
back then, were, were these places that you would go to, were they public or was it like when I was a kid, you go knock on the front door and you just ask them, hey, can I can I go fish? So uh, Patapsco was easy because that's a park. So anywhere you could find a place to park and get in. Uh, the Monocacy was one of the bridges. And there was usually some places that you could get in there. But that's kind of what you were limited to. Mm -hmm. And really still is. But there's a number of those. That, you know, they have a little uh, parking area now. So that part's better. Back then, you were just parking under the bridge and, and getting in the river. And you had to be careful of the private lands. Yeah, it's it's. I have to mention that now because... I, I, I guess I gave bad advice where it's, hey, just go knock on their door and ask permission because when I was a kid, you could do that. But nowadays, it's like you can't do that anymore. It's just a different world where people yeah. are just not willing to give up. And I, and I get it because of liability and stuff, but it's just – it's very jarring to me, like how, how much harder it is to get bank access to get out there and wade. And, and that's where I've gone to the Potomac, the possibilities, and you got the canal. Mm -hmm. So if you're willing to walk, you can, you got miles and miles of access. The canal is interesting. And I guess let's just start there because that just, it piqued my curiosity. <clears throat> Apologies. The canal system, and, and for, for my listeners that aren't from Northern Virginia, you have the, uh, the you have a canal that follows the upper Potomac from, from the falls all the way through past really Hancock and, 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 and continues up. And that's on the Maryland side. And there are stretches of it that, that do hold water. Uh, Little Pool and Big Pool are just two obvious parts of the canal that became a little bit bigger. Uh, what kind of fishing opportunities are on the canal system? So I kind of misspoke there a little bit. Uh, when I say the canal, I'm just walking the towpath. Oh, gotcha. To get access to the Potomac. Which is really what separates the Potomac River apart from so many places where you have this massive pathway, this bike trail, so you can get access to so many parts of the river to fish compared to like the Shenandoah. If you're willing to walk, yes. So what are you looking for this time of year for, for the Potomac River? So as we move into the summer, mm -hmm. When the water warms and cools, I'm looking for the rock ledges, the deeper spots. I'm looking for the, the cooler areas where I have a stream coming in and some shade. And I'm, I'm fishing those areas and, and getting away from people. So the areas that are where, you, where the tubers are coming through and things, I'll avoid those areas on the weekends. I'll hit them during the week. When there's a lot less traffic and on the weekends i'll go west when there's less people and just look for those rock ledges and just a little bit deeper shaded areas and and that's what's really important if you really want good access to fishing and again northern virginia it's really hard i would say get into the maryland side because you can follow the towpath and what i should have done when we first started was have this up but guys don't worry i've finally got my got my act together which is um a topographical map. Uh, I like Google Maps, especially for streaming, because Google Earth just drains my Wi-Fi. And guys, go to uh, the top, go to terrain mode, so it really shows you this. But we're going to start down near the Monocacy here, just to give you an idea. For if you don't understand that there, this path that follows right through the canal system, the CNO Canal, all the way up, and there's plenty of parking. You know, example for me, what I used to do was Brunswick was a, was a place you could park, and then you could go up and up and down. Um, are you doing this mostly on foot or are you using a bike or, or something like that? No, I'm a walker. So it's all, uh, it's all on foot. Oof, dude, that's there's, impressive. There's days I'll get five or 10 miles in. Wow. That's wow. That's impressive. Now I'm not walking the river for five or 10. I'm, I'm walking the towpath and I'm hitting spots. How long do you give a spot? I think this is interesting. Cause when you, when you have, let's say a jet boat, you have this need to move because you feel like I just spent $60,000. I might as well use it. When you are a bank angler, do you send to try to like really milk an area or because you have this tow path, do you tend to like move from spot to spot? Once I get to an area, I'll, I'll, I'll stay in it 30, 60 minutes, maybe a little longer. And then I'll move to another spot if I'm not on fish. 
But I might come back to that spot depending on the time of year and if I feel it's a little early or a little late and uh, and move back to it. And it also depends on what I'm fishing for. Uh, smallmouth, they're not moving much. Walleye, they are. So I can fish an area if I'm if I'm keen in a walleye and I have a, if I feel comfortable they're coming back, I might fish it, maybe not be on them, move to another area, come back an hour later and be on them. Hmm. Cause they're, they're, they're moving. They're fairly active, particularly when it's cold. I didn't even think small about that. Home. That's interesting. I didn't even think about that. Do Are you using different baits and techniques for walleye versus smallmouth, or is it pretty much the jerk baits and things like that and get some crossover? So I'm going to tell you a story. Ooh. So uh, about uh, about 2015, I started winter smallmouth fishing with my brother. And, and he's a guide and uh, he does a lot of uh, fishes all year long. But I had never fished for smallmouth in the winter. I'd be a walleye guy. And I was also a grub guy. I never fished tubes. Hmm. So he said... He, he's catching fish, and he said, you need to try tubes. So I did, and caught fish, and I still had one tide on my line, and I only had the one, and later that week, I went walleye fishing. And I caught 10 walleye before I lost that tube. Ever since then, tubes are a part of my walleye and smallmouth fishing. I have never heard of a tube being that successful for walleye. That's amazing. My techniques... For the two don't vary all that much just the location that's insane now when really and then i guess oh actually let me see if i can find a picture for people that don't uh, actually here's a good one two, two, two. here we go guys so yeah i mean the upper potomac walleye it's insane how much of a success story that is where i, I used to hear rumors of people catching one or two and now it feels like People that go out on that river routinely catch them. It's insane how many of them are in there now. And that's a pretty nice one for the Upper Potomac. Yeah, about 2002, I uh, had a friend of mine. And, you know, come November, I'd, I'd put my fishing gear away, and I'd be done until spring. And he, he said, have you ever done winter walleye fishing? I said, no. And he told me what to do. And every time he'd see me, he asked me, have you done it yet? And uh, his name was Chris, and uh, I said, no, not yet, Chris. And he goes, do it. So I went out, and I tried it, and I caught a walleye. I caught a few walleye. And with my schedule back then, I had more time to fish in the winter than during the warmer months. Mm. So that became a routine for me, uh, fishing for walleye for the last 20-plus years. Uh, I've had days where I've caught as many as 50. Oh my goodness! And and days where you know you, you're lucky to catch one. <laughs> what? I think I think that was a one walleye day right there. <laughs> well, what's the biggest walleye uh, you've ever caught out of the Upper Potomac? Upper twenties, near thirty. That's pretty. That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 as big as walleye that I've caught up north in Canada. Oh my god! You know, I don't get many like that. That's that's a rarity. So it sounds like you're dialed enough that you could be the guy that has the Maryland state record then in a couple of years. There's other guys out there doing real well. I, I've watched a few other guys that are out there and they're, they're catching some nice ball. So there's, I, I think it's there. Will it be me? Probably not. But, uh, there's, there's guys out there that, uh, that are catching and releasing them without any type of, uh, acknowledgement other than a picture. With the Upper Potomac, how how do you think it stacks up in 2023 compared to 10, 15, 20 years ago? Do you feel like it's trending up or is it going down? Where do you think the river is at as, as a whole? So it was going up until about 18. Then 2018, it went, it went way down. It's Now it's back up, uh, not to where it was. But my experience is uh, 18 did a lot of damage to it. And a lot of the grass beds, the gravel bars got wiped out. Uh, the water was constantly high. The spawn had to be bad. I think we have multiple years of poor spawn. Mm -hmm. 
that about three years ago, I started catching more smaller smallmouth. So they might have been 10, 11, 12 inches, but I was catching the numbers of them. This past spring, I caught more, and this is waiting. Uh, I caught more larger smallmouth in the 17, 18, and 19 range than I've ever caught waiting. Now, that's different than boat fishing. I'm one out with my brother, boat fishing. We, we catch some nice smallmouth, particularly in the wintertime. But I was never catching those waiting. I'd get some because, you know, it's a little dangerous to, to wade out to those areas, uh, particularly when the water's cold. So I don't do it very I really don't do that. But, you know, he knows the river well. He knows where to find those spots. So in the wintertime, we get some, we'd still get nice fish. Not like before, but this year, uh, that was one of the most positive I've, I've had on there in a while. Uh, is, is there's, I was, every outing waiting, I was getting at least a 17 or an 18 or not. Good Lord. And then, and then, like always, guys, link in the episode description. I'll link uh, his brother's guide service as well, including all the tackle that we talk about. I mean, that's really interesting to me because I know the um, the department, Maryland's Department of Wildlife Resources, they have a, a a charity tournament, sort of speak, for their fish hatchery program every March April time frame to try to get good stock for their smallmouth spawning program. In the last two years, it's taken 20, 21, 22 pounds, which is impressive i mean that's getting up there closer to like susquehanna style weights which is really awesome to see and one, one thing i think we probably should let the audience know is you could probably break the upper potomac into two sections because i've gotten killed killed for this you have the section that's from harper's ferry down to the falls and then you have the other section which i guess you could say is from harper's ferry all the way up to paw paw and, and so forth are, are you kind of dabbling in all sections of the upper potomac or is there a generic section let's say from harper's ferry to the falls that you prefer so prior to 2018 i would have told you damn form below maybe two or three mile stretch but that year the water was so constantly high that it was washing out the areas that i wanted to fish so then uh, that actually was one of the best learning experiences that I had. Um, I started fishing all the way down to Nolan's Ferry and, and past Dam 5, uh, just learning the river, learning other areas uh, to fish in that higher water environment. And uh, so I've, I've spread that out a lot more than, than I had in the past. Oh, wow. And, so, yeah, that's, that's, so you're right actually down near my area in Williamsport. Um, and you probably fish right below that Williamsport little, little buffer dam then too, which I have fished it. Uh, I avoid it because of the traffic, yeah. you know, when, the, when, when the walleye are in there, so is everyone else. It's insane. And then you have the flathead and then you have the flathead fisherman as well. It just gets packed right there. Yep. <laughs> and I just know guys from a fact, cause I walk my dog down there all the time and I try to sneak a rod when I, there's nobody there. And it's such a rarity to have that section like to yourself at all. Um, and, and it's interesting what you're saying about the, the dam, the wing dam situation, or I'm sorry, the tail race situation that we have with dam four, dam five and Williamsport. When are those sections good for somebody to go to and try to experience bank fishing there? Is it a year round spot or is it better like in the winter, spring, things like that? So for a bank fisherman, it's, it's got to be the, the warmer months. Uh, to fish it when it's cold, you're going to be in the water and you really need to know what you're doing. Uh, when you're talking the water temperatures below 50, but in the wintertime, we're talking upper 30s and 40s, uh, you don't go in and try that for the first time. And, I'm, the and, the area. and I'm definitely going to have to have you back on in October to do more of a safety thing for this, but we'll just reiterate it right now. If you're fishing in the wintertime and you are doing the bank fishing, how do you dress? How are you, are you going alone? Are you going with a buddy? How are you doing that? I fish a lot alone because it's, it's kind of hard to find a whole lot of people that are, uh, that want to wait in the wintertime. Uh, I do have a, a couple of friends that, and we do go out and do that as well. I have three sets of waders. Mm. I have lightweight 
or when the water's 45 and warmer and I'm walking a lot. I have a pair of five millimeter uh, neoprenes, non-insulated for 40 to 45. Okay. And I'm still walking a lot. And then I have my heavy duty insulated ones, which you don't walk very far in those because you'll sweat to death. Oh my gosh. But, but when the water's in the thirties, uh, they keep you nice and warm. That's very important to know. Um, yeah, I didn't even think about that. That like that's such a power move though to have different waiters for different situations versus just going to Dick's Sporting Goods and buying a pair and saying you're going to be okay. Yeah, for you know when it's forty five and above, you could almost wear any waiter that doesn't leak. Although I like the uh, the ones that are tighter for safety reasons, but uh, as opposed to you know the old PVC ones or you know you float in those. But. What uh what boots do you wear? Do you have a particular brand that you like? I, I I wore redheads for years, and they had a, a Velcro closure, but they don't make those anymore. So now I just wear the Sims. Mm. And then my one pair of the insulated ones, they're they're a boot foot. So okay, that for for warmth, boot foot's the best. That's that's good to know. Yeah, because that's something I definitely want to get is is a new pair of waders at some point. And I'm trying to look look into that. And I'm thinking I'm probably going to go Sims, bite the bullet on that. They're expensive, but I, they're they're kind of worth it. They really are. Now, flipping back to this time of year, if you were going to go out, and let's just say, let's start with walleye. That's fine. How do you pack when you don't have a boat or a kayak? Is it one or two rods and that's it? Or is it leave a bunch of extra stuff in the truck and make multiple trips, depending if you have to make change? How, how do you prepare? Well, so I always have four or five rods in the truck and I have my tackle bag with additional gear. But what I carry, uh, I, I can I show you? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm not sure how easily you can see this, but this is a, this is a small tackle belt by Berkeley with a couple of these on it. Oh, wow. That, that, that's all I carry. I, I actually, I bought that in 78 hmm. when I graduated high school. So I've, I've used that for a lot of years. Uh, I don't carry a whole lot of gear with me. If I'm hitting spots, I'll, I'll carry three rods. If I'm really out in the river when it's warmer, covering a big area, out actually in the water, I just take one. But if I'm uh, if I'm just going spot to spot near the bank, I'll carry the three so I can you know change baits quickly and uh, just put two in the tree and, and and fish with the third. What type of what type of brand of Plano is that again? Because that thing is the coolest thing I've ever seen. So that that's a Berkeley. Oh, it's a Berkeley. Apologies, guys. Yes. Yeah, I said Plano, but that, that was incorrect. So. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they still make these. I bought another one a few years ago. That's really cool. I like how it like conforms to your body a little bit. Yes, I don't carry a whole lot. Just light gear. Now, of the multiple rods you take, kind of how do you set up for it? Are you going like ultra light, you know, medium light? Like, what are your your go to setups? Uh, I, I'm I like the the Saint Croix, so I carry two medium action extra fast tip mm -hmm. and one medium light extra fast tip which i really like for some of the more finesse things uh, like the trd something like that and in the winter time if i'm really on jerk baits i might switch one of them out and i have a fourth where i use a braid with a floral leader and run that and if, if, if I think that there might be a lot of active musky, I might take a bait cast. That, that's really rare. Have you caught a musky from the bank? I caught a 44-inch musky on a jerk bait a couple years ago while I fished. Oh, my God. That, that was something. Did you have this uh, on your Instagram? <laughs> yes. I'm yes, probably find... two or three years ago. Okay, I got it. I got to find this thing. That's freaking. So yeah, what's the, I need to know the story of that. Were you actually going out there to hunt him or was it a happy accident? No, it was completely by accident. Every muskie I've caught has been by accident. 
Now, I've gone out once in a while on Target, and I'll get nothing. Uh, but uh, every one I've either fishing for smallmouth or fishing for walleye. That's so freaking cool. And guys, I, I, I'll link the picture in, in the episode description <clears throat> since it's a little hard for me to find two years ago on, on the Instagram. That's that's freaking awesome. Yeah, that's the thing about bank fishing, though. Is you, just because you're, you're limited to how much you can move around doesn't mean you still can't catch them. You know, especially when you're dealing with like rivers and things like that. Now, you, you said uh, you said the TRD, but you're still a tube guy. So are, are you throwing that on your medium rod or on your medium light, the tube? So I have one rod that I just pretty much use exclusively for tubes. Um, it's, it's medium with the extra fast tip. And that one I, I run Florida on. And I'll... Then I'll, I'll run that one all year long like that, even in the winter time, with that floor I want. So there's a cult when it comes to tube versus Ned Brig. And if you ask enough river rats, they will get into an open argument about which is better. Do you have a balanced approach where you'll throw them but both, or are you more of like it's it's tube or die? If they're not, fit, if they're not on tubes, I'm not staying tubes. I, I will always fish a tube, and if I'm if I'm catching, I'm catching. If I'm not, I'm moving on to, you know, either a, a, a TRD or a, a paddle tail or something else that uh, uh, maybe entice a bite. But there's some times that they want one or the other. You know, I've, I've fished all three, and they'll be hitting one, and they won't hit the other two. That's so weird. So I, I don't know why that happens. Power, now, sometimes I think it's color, but when they're really on the finesse, uh, the TRD sometimes sticks up in their face, and they might look at it for a minute, but they'll do the same thing with the tube. Mm -hmm. uh, you slow that tube down, you let it sit for a minute or two, and that might take that long. And I'll just sit there and look at it, and finally just tap it. And then if, if, I, if they're not on the tube or the TRD, I'll go to a flapper. That's when it's colder. So right now, what, what would your go-to, I guess, top three baits be for smallmouth in the summertime? So I'm going with the two for sure. I'm either running the, you know, here's one that I like. It's a. Oh, wow. Yeah, I find it there. So I'll have some type of a tube tied on. Uh, when they're a bit more aggressive, you know, that. When they're a bit more uh, finesse, uh, you know, perfect. Uh, that exposed head. Sometimes that this is that one's a little bit smaller, and and I'll go for that. So I always have uh, one of those on, or uh, or something like that. Oh, I like that color. Is that purple? Purple and uh, that pumpkin? is purple. Yeah. Now, do you have an issue? I, I see that it's an exposed hook setup. Do you ever have an issue with getting snagged with that style? If you're throwing tubes, you're going to lose tubes. No wiser words have been spoken. <laughs> I, I buy them in packs of 100. That's actually really smart. Yes, yeah, because you're, you're going to do it. Just accept it. So I'm, I'm sure there's guys that are running the weed list and probably doing it well. Uh, I've always run without and uh, uh, the Ned head, for whatever reason, they seem to snag a little less. I'm they, not really sure why. Yeah, they're, but they're still not great. Like, uh, I wish somebody would make a ball head, like uh, like a football, not like a completely football style jig head, but some kind of better rock crawling head for for Ned rigs versus that mushroom. Well, I, I'm using. Well, they're they're very similar, the mushroom and the Ned. Well, I'm using that with the two. Ooh, okay, and. Okay. Uh, yeah, this this one. Yep, you raise it up, up a little higher. Dead center, yeah, perfect. There there. So that one seems to uh, snag a little less. I, I love that why. flake. Well, what is that color called? So I'm going to say green pumpkin purple fleck. Okay. Um, it probably has a different name than that. But that's the best description for it. But sometimes that, that just seems to snag a little less. Dude, uh, I'll, I'll start with something like this. 
And if I'm losing a lot, then I'll go to the other one. Uh, hmm. What size? What size weight is that? Eight. An eighth. Okay. So that's eighty percent up to an eighth. How many spares do you take with you? I think that's a very interesting way because, like you said, you're going to lose some. So, are you taking a bunch of of them pre-rigged? Uh, yes. So I, I preload and I have somewhere between. 25 and 35 with a couple of different colors. That is so smart. Four tubes. And then the, uh, the others, like you know, the TRDs and the flappers, I just take the heads and uh, load them as I need them. That, that's really, really smart, guys. And so, again, like if you're, you're going to be bank fishing, come prepared, have your stuff pre-rigged so that you're ready to go. Uh, if you have to, rig up a couple of extra rods with leader material so you have that available to you. And so we talked about the TRD, the tube. Uh, is there any moving baits this time of year that you like? No, yeah, my favorite. Oh, boy. All right, so here, here's my two. Ooh. So uh, there we go. Yeah, perfect. Oh. So... A little bit higher, that's, a little bit higher. There we, there we go. go. So, yeah, I put my hand up there. I can't see it. So that, that'd be my favorite. That's a VMC uh, Moon Eye. Okay. I like that. Uh, sometimes I'll go with a uh, with a ball head. Ah. Sometimes it makes no difference. And if it does, I'd go with the ball head. Uh, those are the two swim baits that I'll throw. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I I catch this time of year. That's the majority of my fish. It looks like you go with more of the um, the natural colors. Then is that like a a brown uh, pumpkin color? So uh, that one is a uh, yeah, right there. Perfect. It's a green pumpkin with a copper fleck, copper a little bit of a little bit of purple in there. Then the other one here, which like I say, that's uh, watermelon. That's one of my favorites there. Uh, that's got some black and some red in it. I'll cool. fish that from a water visibility of about 18 inches to clear. Wow. And then if it's darker than that, then I'll go to a darker. Now, uh, spoon bait. those look like they're handmade. Are, are you pouring those yourself? I do not. Uh, so th this first one here, uh, that's from, uh, snaggler tackle okay snaggler and then this one is uh i think snaggler used to sell it but now i get them from barlow he doesn't sell those anymore and and what size are those baits are they like a, a two 2.5 inch three inch they are um uh three and a quarter three and a quarter. oh a little bit bigger than i thought okay wow yeah, it might be two and three no the three and a quarter three and a quarter, three and a quarter. yeah the tubes are two and three quarters those okay that's a small tube do you prefer that size versus like a three or four inch oh yeah it's all a throw really yep hmm that's interesting okay usually i'll start with like a bigger ned rig before i go down to a finesse one but that's interesting that you're just going to start with the with the little bit smaller smaller. I, I don't even get the others anymore oh wow okay so i just so I, I i caught my at least my personal best recorded smallmouth this spring on a, on a tube, uh, it was 21 and three quarters. All right, let me see if I can find that bad boy. Well, that one looks big, so I'm going to assume it's it's this one. No, that was a big one. That was up in the, that, that's with Canada. It should be up higher, up near the top. Probably the first one. Yep, that's it. Holy smokes, dude. That is a beautiful one. So, so that one was a fair, that one was on a board. So I know how we measured that. Uh, years ago, I caught something I think was bigger. And my brother and I have discussed that because we, we couldn't remember how we measured it. Uh -huh. This was back in the 80s. Oh, wow. But, uh, but this one, at least this was on a board. So I know how big it was. And, and was this the Upper Potomac or the Susquehanna or? That's the Susquehanna. That's the Susquehanna. Okay. I was going to say, like, that looks almost like a state record if that's, if that's from the uh, Potomac. That is beautiful. What is the biggest smallmouth you've caught out of the uh, Potomac? Uh, for me, I've, I've got a few twenties, but that's it. That's that's not bad at all. Now, I know that uh, I know there are others who are catching some. Like, so my brother, he's got some 
21s and 22s out there, but the, my my personal best on the Potomac is 20. Do you think the Upper Potomac can, and I believe, you know what, I just want to make sure before I say something stupid, because I think the state record Maryland smallmouth came out of the Susquehanna, I think, at that dam area. Maryland, do you think the Upper Potomac can actually create or, or have the state record smallmouth in it? It's probably over here. Really? There's there's a big fish in there. Yeah, I'm sure. Smallmouth bass is six pounds. Okay. That's that's not bad at all. So let's if it's not there, it's not far from it. Seven nineteen seventy nine, really? Six pounds? That seems light. The old smallmouth. Smallmouth bass, Susquehanna River. I don't know how that counts. It's got to be that little section that's next there. Smallmouth, six pounds by Charles Jane, 1973, Susquehanna. Oh, yeah, there's got to be a six pounder. There's easily a six pounder in there. That's, which is weird because that's not that crazy of a weight because I know like the Virginia state record largemouth is like 16 and a half. That's a big one. But a six pound smallmouth isn't that terribly hard, I feel like, to get. Huh, that's interesting. That's doable. That's really doable. If you had to, if there was a spot that a person could go and, and have some success, they wouldn't catch a lot. It, where could people go to bank fish um, that is public access? Is there a specific spot that, that you know of that, not necessarily your juice, but a, a generic area that, that's safe for people to go and try to bank fish? On the Potomac? Yeah. So there's a, an area right below Dam 4 that you could stand on the bank and fish some. Uh, Brunswick. Brunswick's probably a little bit up at Hancock. There's some actually near the boat ramp. You could fish a little bit there. Uh, Fort Frederick. Hmm. So if uh, you go up to there and uh, go down to the Potomac, there's some area there that I think could be fished with pretty easy access. Um, let me see. Fort Frederick. Big pool. Big pool. Okay. I am there now. Okay. Right through there. Gotcha. Let me crack another layer on there. So above dam five, you could probably fish some of that. Uh, above dam four, there's so much boat traffic in there. That's kind of tough. Dam five might be the same way. Yeah, I know near Hancock, there's some decent little areas once you get um, near uh, Hancock, the Hancock area. <laughs> right through yeah, here. When my son and I were up there exploring, I, I got a couple of winter spots up there I want to try and looking at over. It, if, uh, it, I'll go to. I could be mistaken, but I've always told people like bank fishing in the wintertime is harder because on a river system, you have got to put in some footwork to find those deeper holes versus if it's the summertime, find a riffle, find any kind of, you know, fast moving water with a little bit of a drop and there's going to be a small mouth in there. Uh, is that correct? Or do you think it's actually maybe a little bit easier to, to catch them in the wintertime? No, you, you need to, the wintertime is tougher. Okay. Uh, they're not active. They're not moving, particularly the small mouth walleye can be a little different, but you don't want to start looking for winter spots in the winter. Mm. You start looking for them in the summer, kind of note where the water level is and watch the gauges. Okay. And then you can, you know, you know what's safe to wait or where you're going to bank fish. But for somebody who just wants to go out and catch some fish, yeah, look for the riffles. There's going to be some pan fish in there, some smallmouth, and, you know, just get out there and get started. Is there any places besides the Upper Potomac nowadays that you like to to adventure to to do wade fishing? For wading, pretty much I'm on the Potomac now. You know, when I go to the Susquehanna, I'm with my brother. I don't wade that. Uh, I, I I need to get back to the Monocacy. I, I there's I've stopped a couple areas. I've looked at it and said, yeah, this is a uh, this is worth going in and looking at again. And then the Patasco I thought about, I haven't fished it since the 80s, maybe early 90s. 
And I've wondered about that going back and looking at it. I need to get you out on the Kanaka jig. I've never fished that. Dude, it's it's insane. Somebody, I remember I was at a boat ramp and someone said like, it's like the little Susquehanna. And so I finally found some places that you can go and access it publicly. And the crayfish in there is insane. Like the bottom of the river is just moving. There are so many crayfish in there. That sounds like a tube area to me. Oh, oh yeah. Like I, I smoke them on a tube and a little Ned rig. And if you go by, oh Lordy, where, where is that? Um, is it 68? I think it's, no, it's not 68. What is it? Uh, Karen, uh, Kit keeps mill road is, is one place that you can go. And then if you go through, uh, highway 40 West highway 40 West, there's Wilson bridge, which they turn into a state park. And so you can walk up or down that, that, that it's, I want to say it's not a Creek. It's really like a small river, but it's only like three feet deep and like four feet at the max in some places and this time of year it's even shallower than that so you can walk for miles both ways and i absolutely and i I absolutely love it like plus it's like like i can walk there from my house to the upper portion of it so that's that's been a lot of fun for me and it's insane in some of these smaller creeks how big a smallmouth you can find in there it to me is like shocking because you wouldn't think a two to three pound smallmouth would be in a creek but they can be in there yeah they said when you know when I was younger, we weren't finding those, but uh, those bigger fish are in there now. Now that particular river, I haven't fished, but. And I like your idea about the the waders because, like, I've always thought, like, for the Conica jig or smaller creeks, like the springtime, you probably could get get them when they have that that feedback on. But you're going to need to have those insul- insulated waders, which is a really good idea. Now, the other thing, though, I wanted to make sure we, we finished off with was the, the walleye thing. Is there any other baits that you'd be throwing if you wanted to target walleye this time of year besides like a tube? Uh, or would you be using live bait? So I, I don't live bait fish very much. Uh, for walleye, once in a while in the wintertime, I'll, I'll float a night crawler. Sometimes they, they just won't touch anything but that. I'll use a slip rig. So... When it's cold, I'm, I'm throwing plastics or jerk bait, but, but now they're moving. So, uh, I might throw a small, uh, maybe a small spinner bait. Hmm. So I'm, for the most part, I'm, I'm using uh, spinning gear. So I don't throw spinner baits very often, but you know, this is a, a, a smaller one here. Oh, nice. That is a little smaller one. So that's a quarter ounce. Okay. So that's from Snaggler. Uh, And I'll throw that on eight pound cast. I'll also, uh, I'll I'll carry some, a a couple of these in there. Oh. Oh, I'm going to turn that. that I haven't get that in there right yet. (laughs) So that's just a jig spinner. Okay. With a number four blade. So you can you put a swim bait on it. Hmm. And you have a kind of like an instant spinner bait if that's the you know if they're hitting on that. So, how, how different is a walleye and a smallmouth when it comes to their behavior in the river? Walleye will move when it's cold. They don't like warm water. So when the water's starting to get in the mid seventies and and warmer. They're going to find cooler water someplace. Hmm. So you find that cooler water, you'll find the walleye. Uh, they'll be more active in the winter time. They'll and they'll come shallower. That's that's why I like fishing for them in the winter time because I can find them in two or three foot of water where I'm not finding smallmouth there. Gotcha. That makes so much sense. Okay. So when the water's in the 30s, that the walleye are going to move. When the water's in the 30s, the smallmouth are holding. It gets up in the 40s, they might move a little bit. Hmm. But uh, uh, then they might, might find them a little shallower, or if the water's real high and they're, you know, they're pushed into the bank or uh, in the feeder creeks or something like that. That is interesting. I didn't even think about that. That just blew my mind on that because, yeah, that, that, that does make sense based on how walleye – their body types and everything that they're going to move shallower because they're they are more active in the winter time even when i fish in the winter time you're going to see them move a lot more especially for a jerk bait things like that they'll 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 rush out for a jerk bait 
Yeah, they're going to they're gonna move a little bit and uh, they'll be more active. So, are you are a heck of a photographer, and I'd have to mention this because when I was looking at your Instagram for some fish pics, I was like, good Lord, it's like Steve Irwin here. Um, do you work for like Nat Geo or something? Because it's insane the amount of wildlife that you have on your Instagram. So my son is a biology major. That makes and, sense. And he and I, we go out and explore and uh, and take those pictures. And uh, like I said, we, we walk the canal a lot and we'll go up in the watershed areas and in the parks and we just turn stuff over and, and, and see what we can find. He, he doesn't really like to fish. He loves to explore. So, uh, you know, we just look for the animals and things like that. That's really awesome. really awesome. That's cool to see people doing that. Cause I mean, we have such a really cool area here with, especially with the trail that you can get out there and get, and just get lost for a little bit. Like it's a little bit of a drive, but I routinely like to take my dog and go walk either at little pool or big pool area, uh, down on, on, on the trail there. And just, it's just so much fun. And it, it's nice that we have such a rural place so close to us that you can go. It, the, the, the canal is cool. There, there's just so much you can, explore and um so i'm actually an engineer civil engineer hmm. and i love to go and look at the structures and see those things that were built by hand so many years ago and, and see them still in place and functioning which which is really neat so i, I do like looking at that that's why i have some of those pictures in my in my account is you know i do like those the fact that people dug that thing by hand that canal or like not by hand, but the point taken manual labor is just fascinating to me. When you look at something that's more than 200 years old in some places. And the fact that that was dug by hand, it's still here is insane. Uh, the, the stonework, it, it's, it's more than an engineering feat. It, it's, it's artwork. Mm -hmm. Just how well that was done and, and actually still there today. For, for much of it, so. it. It was the, is it the Freemasons, right? That, that really, that passed down that, that, uh, I guess it's geometry, right? That knowledge of being able to do that. That I don't know. Cause it's interesting, like how, who passed that knowledge down when you didn't have universities like they are so prevalent today to make structure. I was, I was watching this documentary the other day about the Roman roads and how it's a it's like engineering marvel that these roads were made so perfectly that they're still usable today. And it's like, is it the stuff we make today just meant to fail compared to back then? Because it's so weird how stuff back then just holds up forever. Yeah. So, you know, I think that skill sets just pass from one to another. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's part of the journeyman stage in a lot of trades that the uh, you know, you get a senior person and then they, they teach the next generation. Hmm. Some of those things fizzle, but not everything. No, not, not, not everything. Not everything. Right, Warren, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I, I just, I really appreciate it being able to talk about this area and how many awesome opportunities they are, especially guys use that trail to be able to go up and down and be able to find some places to fish. It really is a brilliant gift for bank anglers to have that thing right there. Uh, I, I'd be remiss if I asked one thing is like, do you have a fishing story that you could tell real quick or one that stands out in your mind? So I'm going to give you two. Okay. So, and, and these aren't fishing stories. They're, they're more like little lessons, I guess. So I, I'd love to fish. And every once in a while, my brother has to remind me, remember, it's not always the fishing. Or it's not always the catching, it's the experience. So you get know, member, you know, because I'll be the last one casting. You know, the boat's pulling out and I'm still casting. And he'll remind me that uh, just remember the uh, remember the experience. Uh, the other I'll throw out there is uh, back in the '80s, I was, I was actually waiting on the Potomac, and. Uh, at that point, the vegetation was really heavy in the river, so which was kind of nice for a wader because it kept the boats out. So this is a section above Lander. Hmm. So, you know, I was out there waiting, and you go out there pretty far. Some places you could almost get to the other side without treading water. Wow. I'm standing about waist-deep water right in front of an open pocket, and I see this head pop out out of the weeds and just looking at me. And I'm staring at what is that? 
And the best I can tell, it was a big hellbender. No it, way. It had a head about three or four inches. And I can't think of anything else that would fit that that look. Um, because the water is just as clear as can be, and I'm looking at it going, "What is that?" And, and years later, I'm talking to my son about that and describing it to him. He said, "Dad, I think that was a hellbender. I don't know that they come that far east, but you know, this was thirty some years ago, so maybe." That's so insane to me because like, it's remarkable. You think if you had a GoPro back then, and it's not to be famous, but just to be able to document stuff, the things that you could have seen. Because I've my friends have talked about seeing river otters back in the day. I've never seen one on the river before. But So I saw my first river otters in the 80s on the Patapsco. Oh, wow. So what I would see was, you know, every once in a while I'd get a glimpse and they, they'd go in their burrow. So is that an otter? And then over the years, I'd watch these otters to the point they, they actually would come out and swim around. Because that kind of kills the fishing. <laughs> a little. But, you know, they and to the point you start to make you a little bit nervous because they're within five or ten feet of you swimming around you. And I'm waiting in the water. But now I've seen them on the Patapsco. I've seen a bunch on the Potomac. There's a bunch in your neighborhood in uh, Williamsport. I, gotta, I have I watched them around that concrete dam. I see them on one end, and next thing you know, they're on the other side. And I'm standing in the water, and there goes the otter. Like, well, there goes the fishing. <laughs> But you know, they're they're all over the place now. That's so. I mean, that means the water quality must be coming back that, than when it from it used to be. If you're seeing more otters around, yeah, the otters are there. Certainly, the beaver are there. They're all over the place now. The uh, water quality is pretty good. After the '85 flooding, it was down because that just washed in so much debris and stuff into the river. I remember wading it back then. And one of the oddest things that we'd come across are pots and pans everywhere for years because of the uh, the flooding in Western Maryland and West Virginia. It washed and, and destroyed so many homes and cabins. All that stuff got washed into the river. Hmm. And for years, we'd find pots and pans in the river. And so I'm sure they flushed on down now or, or, or buried, but. That was just one of the otter things. You, you always see tires. This is so rim. weird. Pots and pans. I would not have had that on my bingo card. No, but I haven't seen them in a long time. But back then in the 80s, you know, after that flooding, they were all over the place. Is it's vegetation starting to come back? Because I remember for a time I've heard stories like there used to be lily pads on some portions of the Upper Potomac and things like that. And now it's like, okay, I'm starting to see it again. So I'm not seeing the eelgrass yet. I'm seeing some of the other vegetation on the banks. Uh, hydrilla and some other things were pretty thick at one point, but I don't see that very often. I'm not seeing the vegetation. The sandbars and the things that held them, uh, you know, they flushed out in 18, and they're just slowly building back up. So I'm not, I'm not seeing a lot of that yet. It's hitting there. But when you when you get that eel grass, you know, and you got, you know, a little bit here and a little bit there, when you find that little bit, it's probably a fish behind. It. Oh, yeah. Like, and it's so funny because on this channel, I talk about the importance of subaquatic vegetation, and it's so vital to the ecosystem, whether it's a river or a lake. And and so many people look at it as a weed, and you have to, you know, put chemicals or grass carp to get rid of it, but Without that, you're not going to have your smallmouth population, your bait fish, or if, if it's a major reservoir, you're not going to have your largemouth population. Yeah, you, you need those. That's, that's part of the ecosystem and part of what holds them there. It is. It is. Warren, thank you so much again for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Um, guys, link in the episode description to everything we talked about, including his brother's uh, guide service. Did you want to actually just give a shout out to him uh, now? Yeah, I'm just, well, yeah, I've learned a lot from him. He's, he's a good bit younger than I am, but... Uh, uh, he's an excellent fisherman, uh, SJ Fishing Adventures, Scott Johnson. Uh, he spends a lot of time on the Potomac and a lot of time on the Susquehanna. Boom. Perfect, guys. And again, I'll link his website and his contact information in the episode description along with everything else we talked about. Please like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out in the algorithm. You know, we're always ranked right now on Apple Podcasts 
nationally as a fishing show, which is amazing. And we are still the number one fishing show in the greater DMV metropolitan area. We'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.